ANA eLearning Academy is brought to you by CDN Graysheet, a trusted source of rare coin and currency valuations since 1963. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the ANA eLearning Academy. The ANA would like to thank our eLearning partner, Graysheet, for their support of the eLearning program. Today, we have Dr. Hans H. Liu, who will be presenting, Is Anything Ever Really New? Coin and Currency Deja Vu Over Two Millennia. All attendees will be muted for this presentation. If you have any questions, you may put them in the chat or Q&A box, and I will read them to our presenter at the end of his presentation. Now, I will turn the time over for the presentation. Dr. Liu, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Hopefully everybody has my um, first slide on and I will be uh, removing the image uh, of myself shortly so as not to be a distraction. Uh, I believe it's morning time where many of the listeners are. Uh, I'm in Philadelphia, so it's about noon time. Uh, and as Sam uh, Gelbert mentioned, I'm a physician uh, by profession and an infectious disease specialist uh, by training. And usually when I speak, I speak on antibiotics or infections or lately a great deal about coronavirus. So in, in view of that, I thought I'd start out with a doctor joke. The way this one goes is that four doctors go duck hunting and it's early in the morning and there's a psychiatrist, an internist, a surgeon and a pathologist. Uh, and they take turns shooting. So first the psychiatrist is up and early in the morning, the ducks come over and he raises a shotgun and he says, well, they quack like ducks and they look like ducks, but I wonder what they're trying to express to us. So he misses a shot and has to sit down. The internist is next up and he sees more ducks come over and he says, well, they look like ducks and they quack like ducks, but we have to rule out geese. So he misses his shot. At which point the surgeon gets up, blasts away and turns to the pathologist and says, go out there and see if any of those things that I shot are ducks or not. And so the theme of the story is that everybody approaches their profession or hobby differently. I know some people who are fascinated by the artistic beauty of coins, other with the very striking historical associations. For example, how often can you hold something in your hand that was produced under the reign of Alexander the Great and moreover depicts uh, probably a lifetime uh, portrait uh, of that uh, ruler. Uh, finally, some people thrill in the chase and the satisfaction in completing a type collection or, or a complete set. Now, my story is probably similar to some of yours. I started collecting coins as a kid. I had the blue Whitman folders and check pocket change. Uh, but what I'm going to tell you next will date myself severely. At that time, silver coins were in circulation. If you won a contest, uh, uh, in elementary school, say a debate contest, you often got your prize uh, in uh, silver dollars. I remember as a teenager ordering an almost uncirculated Liberty Head Eagle, uh, half, uh, well, it was a half Eagle coin for $29. And I think that was probably the equivalent of 25 cent per gallon gasoline, which I also uh, caught the, uh, the tail end of. Now then going on to college, I got very busy. And to be honest, I was probably more of an accumulator for many years uh, rather than a collector. But there were occasional deep dives into uh, topics that interested me or coin stories that I really, really wanted to research. Now, what we're going to talk today is uh, about whether just joshing with gold-plated nickels is kidding around or serious financial fraud. We'll talk about uh, paper money versus hard money and some of the differences and similarities over a span of 600 years. We'll talk about what's in a denomination because that's very much uh, in our minds when we refer to coins in our collection or bills in everyday use, but it turns out that is a relatively new uh, de designation because coins used to be based strictly on size and, and perhaps weight. 
We'll talk about uh, turning guns into money, which is a play on the old term swords into plowshares. Uh, and finally, we'll try to wrap up with does size matter and a couple of conclusions. Now, all of the coins and notes that will be shown are in my collection uh, with a few examples, which I'll try to remember to point out. So here's a, a story that I think uh, most uh, collectors will know. Uh, and this is an 1883 Liberty Head Half Eagle coin. It's a beautiful design. The eagle uh, had been in use in, in a form similar to this, almost unchanged since the presidency of Thomas Jefferson. Now, in 1883, the United States replaced the shield nickel uh, with the Liberty Head nickel. And the reverse, as you can see, had a prominent V, the Roman numeral for five, uh, but there was no mention of cents. And of course, unscrupulous types got the idea to gold plate the nickel and pass them as $5 gold pieces. The most engaging story uh, is one which uh, is supposed to in include a, a deaf mute named Josh Tatum. As the story goes, in the 1880s, he would come into a store, pick an item, perhaps a five cent cigar, uh, place a gold plated Liberty nickel on the counter face up and point at it at which point he would either be given $4.95 and change, nod politely and leave, or he would get no change and he would still uh, take a cigar and go. Now, when merchants started to catch on to the fact that these weren't $5 gold pieces, but gold plated nickels, uh, he was hauled into court and charged with fraud. And it said that his lawyer argued that he was a deaf mute. He never could have claimed it was a $5 gold piece. And so ultimately, uh, the name or term Josh was used to mean I'm just kidding. Uh, now, I found that uh, some authors who tried to trace that story to a real individual by going to newspapers of that era were unable to. So it may just be a, a convenient and interesting story. We don't know that uh, the racketeer nickel as this nickel was eventually uh, named, uh, has been sold in sets to collectors and people just uh, interested. Uh, this slide shows the genuine coin along with four um, of the gold-plated nickels. Uh, my pointer is on the one which is most evenly plated, uh, but the color is not quite right. It's, a, it's a, a pale yellow without the richness of the gold. Now, all of these were shot in one frame, so the, the most gold item is very shiny and in fact looks like a child's coin, which might be plastic and plated with, with some kind of gold plating. Uh, so it looks real in some light and not in others. This one is probably the closest in terms of a, a, a gold color, but is marred by the discoloration. Uh, and then the last one clearly was made uh, for uh, collectors or just to be sold uh, as a racketeer nickel because it's dated 1911, well after uh, the coin was changed. And as you can see, the reverse of these pieces give away the story. You have the $5 half eagle here. You have the coins from 1883. And the one from later on has sense, though not, not particularly prominently, uh, though the US Mint felt this was enough to, to derail the, uh, the fraud. And as you can see, this is the, the second version uh, or variant of the Liberty Nickel of 1883. I note that there was a confusion between the nickel and the half eagle, even without gold plating. Uh, a comment from a bar owner in the 1980s uh, says that he used to occasionally find $5 gold pieces in his nickel jukebox. And this just goes to show that you can be too drunk to tell a gold piece from a nickel, uh, but still functional enough to make a jukebox work. Now, as I said, things tend to occur uh, and recur because of similar circumstances. And about two generations earlier, in 1821, the British Royal Mint began producing a new design of British half sovereign because George IV had ascended to, to the throne the prior year. And he succeeded George III, who was, of course, the king that the American colonies rebelled against. The half sovereign is a small, thin coin. It's just a tiny bit larger than a US dime, probably about a millimeter and a half and about the same thickness. Uh, 
It's almost exactly the same size as a British farthing, which is a bronze or copper coin with less than a tenth of a millimeter difference. And it's within a millimeter of, I'm sorry, of the uh, half the sixpence. And it's within a millimeter of the farthing, which is the, the bronze coin. So they have a series of gold, silver, and bronze coins that are within about uh, 1 25th uh, of an inch of each other. Now, one story that's told illustrating some of the problems that caused was that one of the few joys of a junior bank clerk in the Bank of England was being assigned to count uh, farthings, the, the uh, tiniest coin of the realm, uh, and presumably in looking at an uncirculated badge coming across a, a gold half sovereign that had been mixed in uh, accidentally. Now, this is the companion sixpence of George IV, which is also issued in 1821. Uh, this is a rather beat up specimen uh, from my collection. And if you compare the half sovereign at the top with the sixpence at the bottom, uh, and actually I've substituted a slightly better uh, obverse view of a different coin, you'll see that the uh, portraits are very similar, identical uh, almost. And the reverses both have a crown shield with uh, some garnish around it. And these also look very similar, especially if you realize that this is about the size of our current uh, dime. Now, the Royal Mint made a few uh, not very convincing changes to the reverse of the gold piece. Uh, for example, uh, in 1824, three years after the initial issue, they changed the shield to a more angular and austere version, uh, but they couldn't help themselves. And by 1827, they had gone back to a more curvy shield still with the crown. And even by the following uh, Ron monarch's reign in 1831, they had pretty much stayed with the, the crown shield. Now the designers of minor co uh, coinage for the Royal Mint tried rather harder. So these are the original two from 1821. Uh, by 1824, they had encircled the crowned shield with a garter. Uh, again, a different visual appearance, but perhaps hard to spot uh, at that size. And finally, by the end of George IV's reign, they had gone to a lion surmounting a crown. And this was rather distinctive. And actually one of the the favorite pieces of the British public because of the, the lion and the symbolism, but it unfortunately proved to be short-lived as you'll later see. Now, so this by the, the reign of the next monarch, William IV, the design had been changed <clears throat> to the word sixpence with a crown and with a wreath. And I think the, the government felt that that would uh, fix the the gold plating and, and fraud problem. However, the problems continued and the government tried to make the half sovereign smaller and thicker in 1834, but the public was not very receptive to that as the coin was already uh, quite small. And in 1836, uh, in a mint error, they struck the half sovereign using an obverse uh, from the sixpence piece because they were so close in size. Unfortunately, the size of the bust of the king William IV was different uh, on the two coins and this became rather noticeable. And ultimately the government recalled most of the uh, error coins uh, and melted them down. Uh, this week I saw one advertised online for low five figures in, in US dollars. So they are uh, quite rare. Now the story still doesn't end there. By 1837, uh, <clears throat> Queen Victoria, had ascended to the British throne and she was age 18 and her coin had a young head bust uh, depicting her at that age. Uh, this uh, head was used uh, for almost five decades. Uh, I note that only a few people have had the ability to present so youthful an image to their public for so many years. One of them that comes to mind, and you can tell this from his coins, is Augustus Caesar, who was emperor of the Roman Empire. Uh, the other is Lucille Ball of I Love Lucy TV uh, show fame. Uh, and so the uh, young head bust went on 
to be used for many, many years, though there was a dalliance with a Gothic bust with Gothic style lettering and sometimes Roman numerals in the 1850s and 1860s, uh, but that's part of another story that we should be able to get to. Now, this shows that as of 1887, uh, it, had, it was the Jubilee year of Victoria's reign. And in, in honor of this, the Royal Mint and many other groups uh, created new uh, portraits. This is the uh, Jubilee uh, head um, of Victoria from 1887. Uh, and of course, uh, the silver coinage followed along. So here you have a sixpence shown it as almost exactly the same size as the half sovereign. You would have thought that someone would have remembered uh, the problems that the Royal Mint had in the 1820s and 1830s, or, or maybe even taken note of what it was going on in the United States from a few years before uh, with the gold-plated Liberty Head nickel, but nonetheless, they, they pushed ahead. Uh, and this shows you that they had dropped the uh, reverse with the six pence designation and gone back to a crown shield with a garter. And again, you have the confusion between the two coins. <clears throat> now, this um, is something I acquired a number of years ago. It's a six pence uh, that's been heavily circulated, but it's also been gold plated. And you can see around the periphery. Uh, that it probably at one time was fairly richly plated in gold. Oops. <clears throat> uh, and so, you know, the question arises, was this a, a true fraudulent uh, British version of the racketeer nickel, or is this something that was made uh, at a later date uh, just for collectors to illustrate the problem? But either way, uh, it shows some uh, uh, parallels in problems with the coinage size and also uh, uh, the fraud of, of gold plating. And so ultimately, another version of the sixpence was issued in 1887. Uh, the former um, uh, design was withdrawn and they went back to the uh, tried and true sixpence design, uh, similar to the five cents designation on, on US coins. Oh, incidentally, I should mention uh, that um, the Jubilee head went out of use, not so much because uh, of the end of the Jubilee, but because the British public really disliked the dainty little crown uh, on someone who was the monarch to the entire British Empire. So it uh, got some poor publicity and, and uh, was taken out of uh, use in 1891, about uh, five years out. Now we, we come to an issue uh, contrasting paper and hard money. I have a friend from a prominent family uh, who's been a very successful investment manager. And once in a while, uh, he'll still uh, rail against fiat money. Uh, fiat money is money that has no intrinsic value of its own. And I remember telling him uh, at one point, I think I gave him an example of US World War II currency that had been uh, imprinted uh, Hawaii on the reverse and, and suggested that he really should start to get worried when he sees Federal Reserve notes circulating with Philly stamped on the back. Now, this is uh, another note that I really like. Uh, it's from 1886. Uh, and if you look at the reverse, it has a, a lovely shade of green depicting five Morgan dollars, both the obverse uh, and the reverse. Uh, you look at a slight enlargement, uh, and there are at least a number of reasons for the uh, motive for the artwork uh, shown on this bill. Uh, the major one was probably that the United States had major silver mines in the West and powerful political lobbies that were encouraging the use of this tangible asset. And I remember some very fiery orators uh, as well decrying. Uh, you know, crucifying uh, the economy on a cross of gold. Uh, also, there had been decades of broken banknotes and worthless Confederate currency. And so this was a way of reinforcing the idea that paper money was as good as the, uh, the hard stuff. Now, this is a, another uh, example. I do not own this. I, I would love to, 
but it's a US gold note from the same era depicting a variety of coins, in this case, both uh, silver and gold with the same idea of granting uh, more uh, legitimacy to the paper money. Now, it turns out uh, the idea is not new. If you, if you go back 600 years, you'll find depictions of coins on paper money. This happens to be from the Chinese uh, Ming Dynasty. Uh, this was in 1368 to 1399. And in fact, uh, China had been using uh, paper money printed on mulberry bark uh, for some centuries before, and, and some uh, dynasties more so, and some dynasties they were uncommon. But it really seems to have picked up during the Ming Dynasty. Uh, this uh, bill, which is quite large, it's probably more than a foot uh, top to bottom, uh, shows five, I'm sorry, um, 10 strings of cash coins, which would add it up to about uh, 1,000 cash. And this was the value of the note. This is similar to what Marco Polo would have seen during his travels in Asia from 1271 to 1295. And he came back to his native Venice with these uh, astounding stories of gunpowder, for one, uh, unbelievable ones like people treating paper notes as though they were a hard currency uh, and uh, beautiful porcelain, which eventually came to be imported uh, into Europe and, and ultimately duplicated. Uh, however, Marco Polo probably did not introduce uh, noodles to Italy, though that's also been claimed uh, from time to time. Uh, now, it turns out the notes um, and one of them was actually issued during a, a uh, I think an ANA event uh, several decades ago with a reproduction <clears throat> as a reproduction. But this shows that it was printed primarily on the obverse with a, 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 with printing on the back and red seals. I'm told that the seals say that counterfeiters will be pub, punished by death. Uh, with one half of their estate being given to the informant. So this can not only be considered an early example of paper money, uh, but an early example of a whistleblower reward program. Now, I just wanted to contrast this with cash coins. This is a one cash coin from the early Ming Dynasty, which would have been contemporaneous with the note that I showed. It's a relatively large coin. Uh, you can see here it's the, about the size and the weight of a United States uh, quarter. Uh, and these have been discovered in huge quantities. This is an excavation where they've broken into a hoard of these coins. And, and this shows you how many they are and explains why many of the ones that we now see on the market uh, have green uh, corrosion and often are fused into uh, to clumps. Uh, it turns out that there were um, large, higher denominations of money. For example, there were silver uh, sai chi or boat shaped ingots for large transactions. And it turns out one ounce of silver was equivalent to about a, a thousand cash coins at some point in Chinese history. Uh, but the cast ingots were somewhat bulky and varied enough in weight that they had to be weighed uh, in transactions, so not, not particularly convenient. Uh, somewhat larger denominations of cash coins were made. These are a few examples from my collection, which are not from the Ming Dynasty, but they're sh uh, shown to give you an idea of how big they are compared to the U.S. quarter. And I located an example uh, in a um, auction catalog. This is a 10 cash coin from the Ming Dynasty. Uh, so 100 of these would have been the equivalent of the note. And the reason I like this illustration is because it really shows the, the extraordinary size of this. Unfortunately, the, the early concept of paper money in China, um, even though used for hundreds of years, ultimately failed toward the end of the Ming Dynasty in the 1600s. This was due to a lack of confidence by the public and inflation, uh, and ironically, by the introduction of uh, foreign large denomination gold and silver coins, uh, notably the, uh, the Spanish dollar or pillar dollar. Now, one of the uh, things we're going to move on to is what's in a denomination. And I have to tell you the story that uh, during the years I was very busy 
uh, with my profession, I would pursue certain uh, coins or bills at a general interest or because it was part of a specific quest to, to answer a question. And for a lot of that time, it involved perusing coin publications, paper mailing lists, visiting coin shops and shows because, uh, because of course, there was no internet. And I was probably more of an accumulator uh, than a true collector during those years. And, and a number of times I, I pulled a, a Hearst. Um, many of you know that William Randolph Hearst was a wealthy newspaper publisher in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He, he went for uh, sensational uh, press. Uh, I believe he is the a person who printed on yellow paper and, and the term uh, yellow journalism originated with that. And he's even rumored to have started wars uh, to sell newspapers, but he became fabulously wealthy uh, and um, built uh, Hearst Castle in San Simeon, California. He filled it with antiques, fireplaces, actually entire rooms from castles in Europe and had the occasional movie star uh, in the uh, pool downstairs. And the story goes that he once saw a pair of ornate uh, Renaissance candlesticks in an auction catalog, an old auction catalog. And he summoned his curator of collections <clears throat> and said, I want those candlesticks. I don't care what it takes. I don't care how much it is. I want those candlesticks. So the curator dutifully read up on the auction catalogs, uh, cabled uh, uh, auction houses in Europe and elsewhere, and actually took a steamship uh, in those in those days. That was the only way really to get to Europe and talk with different collectors and dealers in Europe. And after about five or six months, came back to San Simeon and said, well, you know, I found the candlesticks in your storehouse uh, downstairs. You bought them a couple of years ago and you've had them all the time. So I, I have been guilty of this, though, with much, much more uh, uh, inexpensive coins. Uh, I remember for a time I was seeking a papal scudo, a uh, large silver coin, uh, but I was looking for a specific date. A and I have uh, had in recent years looked through hundreds of listings, and you can do that now relatively easy by going online and finding some of these large sites to deal with dozens or hundreds of dealers. And I found many of the common dates, but just couldn't find the date that I was interested in. And then in preparing for this talk, I, I found one. And so it was in my collection. I had forgotten about it. Uh, and the other thing is that my wife has often pointed out that I buy the same coin over and over again. Now, I rationalize this <clears throat> as saying, well, you know, I I'm upgrading the, the condition of the coin or I'm buying a pair so I can display the, the front and the back, or now I'm into getting variants. But I think what happens is when you really search for something, you get locked into it. And when you see it, you buy it. And in any case, going through my collections for this talk, I seem to have an inordinate number of uh, 18th century, 19th century British sixpence and, and Spanish pillar dollars. Uh, which fortunately were purchased before counterfeits became uh, more common. So moving on, we're trying to answer the question, what's in a denomination? And this is a 1795 uh, Liberty uh, cap half cent. It was one of the first coins Ill issued by the newly independent United States of America. It states prominently United States of America, uh, it also has the denomination of half cent, uh, and to get the message across uh, even more, it has one over 200, uh, the, de the uh, fractional equivalent of uh, one half of one uh, cent, which is one hundredth of a dollar. Now, this is a coin from 2,000 years prior to that. It's a coin of Populonia, a region of Italy that was the successor to the land of the Etruscans, who, of course, were the forerunners of the Romans. There have uh, long been rich mines in the region, including silver mines. Uh, and this coin was struck around 211 BCE. Um, personally, I would have been a little freaked out walking around with a pocket full of coins showing the Medusa, but other portraits included Apollo. Uh, and what's striking about this, uh, and you can see it's it's a uniface strike, uh, is that it's a, a moderately sized coin, size of a US nickel, but much thicker. And it has two X's on them, 
which are the denomination. Now, in those days, uh, coins were, were marked uh, for a variety of reasons, political, uh, to show the wealth of a city-state or a ruler. Uh, but in commerce, uh, unless you were within a given city-state, uh, they were um, suspect and might have to be weighed for transactions. Or, for example, Athenian owls are often found with tusk cuts if they circulated outside uh, Athens itself to make sure they were truly fine silver. Now, these coins from 211 BCE were marked with two Xs for the denomination of 20. And in fact, you can find coins marked with a one, a V for five or X for 10 in some combination. And these are of course the numbers familiar to us as Roman numerals. And they were also more or less on a decimal system. So they're some of the first coins on a decimal system and also to bear a standardized set of denominations. Now, yesterday I was reviewing my slides for this talk and I realized I really need to show at least one example of British medieval coinage. Uh, and these are two coins which uh, are from an auction catalog. They're really different sizes. The upper is a milled sixpence of Elizabeth I, which is a smaller coin. And the bottom is a shilling of the same reign, which is hand hammered. So there are a number of differences. But the one I'll call your attention to is the rose behind the ear of the queen. And it turns out that while there are a lot of uh, legends and, and other statements, including the titles of the ruling monarch, uh, there are not denominations on many British coins. And this probably made a certain amount of sense when much of the population was illiterate. And when you had coins of similar size, the British mint took to putting a rose on alternate uh, alternating coins so that if somebody had a, a medium-sized silver coin and it had a rose, it was a sixpence. If it lacked the rose, it, it was a shilling. Um, <clears throat> and I just pulled a coin out of my uh, British uh, coin uh, container. Uh, and this is a one uh, penny piece from 2007. Uh, and this shows that some things don't change. Now this has a denomination but other than the inscription, Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, Queen and Defender of the Faith, 2007, uh, there's no indication of the country. So English coins uh, sometimes uh, miss the denomination, sometimes they miss the designation of the country. And this is in contrast to what we saw earlier, the US half cent, which proudly proclaimed the name of the country uh, and also the denomination, uh, which was a way of differentiating it from the um, uh, former mother country. It may be similar to the choice of red stripes separated by white stripes on the US national flag, uh, though I think this is subject to interpretation. But I note that during the uh, late 18th century, uh, a good number of ideas were being uh, discussed and debated by people like Jefferson and Franklin, uh, and these included things like democracy and also a decimal coin system in place of the uh, British system of 20 shillings uh, each uh, consists of, uh, I'm sorry, a British pound consisting of 20 shillings, each consisting of 12 pence. And just to touch on a couple of other areas, here's a um, link to philately. This is the 1840 British penny black stamp, which is the worst, world's first adhesive postage stamp. Uh, the prior to this, there were postal services, but the postage was usually paid by the recipient and designations were either handwritten or there was some kind of franking system uh, used locally to indicate where, where and when the letter was mailed. Uh, and if you didn't pay for the letter at the end, they, they just never gave it to you. Uh, when Britain decided to issue adhesive postal stamps, they went big, they printed over 68 million of this first issue. Uh, and as a result, it's relatively affordable even today. And you'll see uh, there's the queen, there's the denomination and the indications useful for postage, but no country. And just to show you, this is the stamp that was on the um, parcel in which the stamp was mailed to me a couple of years ago. And it shows that some things don't change very much, denomination, uh, no country. Uh, and finally, we have a uh, kind of a crossover a numismatic uh, philatelic item 
Uh, on the left is a crown from the Isle of Man issued for the 175th anniversary of the British penny black stamp. On the right is a 50 pence piece from Gibraltar uh, for the 180th uh, anniversary. And just to indicate that uh, if you invent something, you kind of get to control the rules for it. Uh, the British tend not to put their, their country name on stamps. In the United States, uh, the uh, country code for international calling is uh, 01 uh, because the U.S. essentially established the telephone system. Uh, now, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about um, swords and the plowshares, and that is shares. I always thought it was shears, but corrected myself when I looked this up and point out that uh, about uh, just a few years ago, I came across a wonderful book by Kenneth Bressett titled Milestone Coins. And it had some wonderful coin stories uh, and they were similar uh, to some of the stories that I was interested in and I tried to uh, find uh, uh, samples of to acquire. And it was actually published a dozen years prior in 2007 and I missed it because I've been lecturing a lot in those days. In fact, I think around 2007, I once flew 120 segments on US Airways alone. And a segment is one takeoff and one landing. So that was a lot of time on an airplane. Uh, but pilots have reassured me that if the number of your takeoffs equals the numbers of your landings, you're probably doing okay. Now, what's interesting about the book is that I bought the book uh, and treated myself to reading a chapter or two at a time. Uh, and as I got to the end of the book, uh, I realized that even though the cover illustrated a number of coins I was really interested in, I'd seen no mention of it. So I went through and examined the book more carefully and realized that it was missing about 40 pages. So I have an error copy and had to go out and buy another copy of the book to, to finish reading it. Now, this is something uh, common to kids who grew up with penny folders uh, in the 50s and 60s and 70s at least. And this is a um, set of shell case cents from 1944 to 1945. There was a very nice article from the Numismatist uh, publication recently that shows that the uh, composition of US cents was actually changed subtly in 1942 because of the war. And of course, in 1943, it was zinc plated uh, steel. Uh, and in 1944, the shift was made to um, shell case copper. Now copper was a strategic metal. This is because uh, it can be used for shell cases where the malleability uh, and uh, corrosion resistance are useful. A number of countries have tried to use steel, uh, but you have trouble with fractures in the metal and, and corrosion. And it turns out uh, copper wasn't hugely valuable. In some places, military bases uh, where they were training soldiers would bury the shell cases because they had so many of them. But the idea was gotten to recycle them uh, as pennies. And this, in fact, is what was done. Now, it turns out the idea, again, is not new. Uh, in the late 1600s, James II was dethroned as a monarch of Ireland. Uh, and in his quest to regain the throne, uh, he, uh, he needed money. And ideally, he needed hard money in silver and gold, which he didn't have. So he and his supporters rounded up uh, cannon, it said, but also probably church bells, tableware, and so forth, and struck these into uh, bronze pieces of currency, but in silver denominations. And here you'll see this is a uh, crown. It actually started out as a half crown in 1689. And there was just uh, there was inflation very quickly. So it was re-stamped uh, as a crown. Uh, there's a, another a lower denomination piece, a half crown uh, and a, a shilling. And what's interesting, the interesting twist on this is that uh, on the reverse, at least of some of these, you'll see not only the year of issue, but the month of issue. This is May 1690. This is October 1689. And the idea behind the king and his return to uh, the monarchy 
uh, was that uh, he would reward his followers who accepted this money uh, by exchanging it for true gold and silver, but he would do it in the order in which the money had been uh, had been coined. Well, he he never made it back to the throne, and the money was eventually um, repriced at the copper price, and then finally demonetized a few years later. Here's another example. These are Nepalese coins, uh, I think from the 1950s, uh, which were recycled uh, shell cases or cartridges. I believe some of the initial ads, uh, let me show you the size of these, they're roughly the size of a US dime. I believe the, the initial uh, advertisements claim that these were the cutoff ends of shell cases and that this was the hole for the primer. But if you look at the size of this, that's, that's rather hard to believe unless this started life out as a, a large caliber bullet, like a 50 caliber. In addition, it has a fairly good uniformity and uh, markings on both sides. So it's certainly not a, a uh, expedient created by, by cutting off the ends of cartridges, rather in the correspondence from the Nepal Coin Society in the 1990s, they pointed out that a general had spotted a number of used shell cases in an arsenal in Nepal and it suggested they be, be made into coins. So I think they were made, melted down, uh, re, uh, uh, cast and stamped, uh, but uh, there are unfortunately only enough metal for one year's run. Now here's another example from 1902 in Colombia during the, the Civil War. This is from the Santander faction, and this is a more crudely struck uh, item, um, uniface, and in fact so thin you, you sometimes find them with tears or piercings. Again, it's a fairly large coin, but quite light because of its thinness. Uh, and I believe these were struck from shell cases, at least re from reading an ad from a dealer uh, whose opinion I respect, but I tried to look this up recently and wasn't able to, to nail it down. And finally, uh, there are a couple examples. This is a medal, uh, and you'll see that it's from a uh, victory loan drive large, about the size of a half dollar. And on the back, it indicates that it's for patriots who took out these Liberty loans and it was made from captured German cannon. So again, um, swords into plowshares. And this brings the discussion into the space age. This is a Russian peace coin. I'll show you the other side uh, from the 1980s, 1988. And this says it was uh, struck with metal uh, from a, uh, uh, a rocket ship and, and there, are very, there are variations on this. So we have a, we're winding up with the question of does size matter? And I think this has come up a lot. Uh, in fact, the controversy between the Susan B. Anthony dollar and its similarity in size to the US quarter not too many years ago uh, is probably too easy of a target. So we'll pick some other examples. This is an 1875 silver coin from the Carson City Mint. Um, in fact, it's a 20 cent piece minted for four years and it is contrasted in size with an 1876 uh, Liberty seated quarter. The reverses both feature eagles, though facing in different directions. And one says uh, 20 cents and the other says a quarter dollar. Uh, but of course there was a confusion. And, and I, I wanted to bring the discussion back to Great Britain in, in the uh, Victorian era. This was where we left off before with the 1887 uh, Victorian Jubilee had sixpence. Recall that it started out uh, looking like this um, and wound up going through the Jubilee head uh, and then after 1887 reverted to the, the lettering on the back. Now, in the lead up to the Jubilee, a Gothic head was used for a number of years. Uh, this was a, a very, uh, I think, a artistically striking, um, this is the Florin coin. And it's interesting, not only because of his choice of the, the Gothic appearance, but it was a new denomination of two shillings, which was not something that was 
uh, prominent in, in English uh, coinage up to that time. There was the half crown, which was two and a half shillings, uh, but it was about one, I have to think about this, uh, one eighth of a pound, whereas the florin was one tenth of a pound. And in fact, this one says uh, one tenth of a pound. Uh, and this was in part because of the interest in decimalization, even in the, the mid 19th century. Now, this is another coin from the same time in 1847 Gothic crown. Note that the uh, lettering is now in Gothic or text format, rendering it rather difficult to read. And if you look here in the corner, the date is a Roman numeral. And it says uh, M uh, for a thousand, then DCCC for 800, so 1800. Then it's XL, but you have to subtract the 10 from the 50 to make 40, because that's the way the Romans, the Roman numeral system went. And then there's VII for seven, so it adds up to 1847. But the struggles in uh, working with the Roman numeral system was similar to some of the struggles in studying Latin. And I remember in many years of Latin, classes, uh, students would say to each other, uh, Latin is a dead language, dead as it can be. First it killed the Romans, and now it's killing me. In any case, getting back to uh, the Jubilee year, uh, they issued a double florin. And this was four shillings. Again, I think an idea to introduce the idea of a decimal currency system. And this was a large, fairly impressive coin, the, the size of American uh, silver dollar, not too far off the weight. The problem, it also was similar in size and not too far off the weight of a British crown, which was a denomination that had been issued for literally hundreds of years. Now, the reverses were quite different. So no one would mistake a double florin for a crown looking at this, but in a darkened pub, if only the, uh, the obverse was seen, uh, mistakes could be made. And so the double florin gained the nickname of the barmaid's grief uh, because of the confusion. And ultimately it was only issued uh, for, for four years. So with that, I, I wanna wind down. <clears throat> uh, I will say that uh, when I'm teaching a new group of medical students or medical residents uh, on a month, I'll say, look, I wanna take good care of our patients. I wanna learn some medicine and I wanna have some fun. And so I will admit that I've learned a great deal about my collection, uh, even more over what I thought I knew before in preparing uh, this talk. I, uh, it led me to purchase a number of numismatic references. I learned a great deal, but not nearly enough about photographing coins, because prior to this, I'd kind of been using a, a smartphone, and, and this led me to use a, an honest-to-God SLR. Uh, I think I've gotten better, I hope, on Zoom presentations, uh, and I've had a chance to reflect on how much fun I've had collecting coins and bills uh, and medals. And in fact, thinking back, I said uh, that Different people had different reasons for getting into collecting. Sometimes it was for the beauty of coins, sometimes for the historical connections, uh, sometimes for the satisfaction of the pursuit and amassing a, a, a given collection. And I realized I was talking about myself because I enjoy all of those. And I think some of you there have similar reasons. Others have different ones, but I think they're, they're all good. And with that, I'll stop and turn things back over to Mr. Gelberg. Okay, Hans, thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. Uh, hope everyone out there uh, learned as much as uh, I did, uh, although I don't want to hear about uh, people going out there and plating any of their sixpences right now with gold. So again, I really want to thank Graysheet for their partnership uh, with the a a Learning Academy, and we hope you will join us for our future webinars. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But right now, uh, Dr. Liu, we... Uh, just want to go uh, over a couple of questions that we had. Um, first, let's see. Uh, one person said, thank you. Very nice talk. What happened to Ricardo? Is he okay? I'm not sure uh, who they're referring to as Ricardo. Uh, uh, I know we've had uh, another presenter and a summer seminar uh, 
instructor by that name who's come here before. So I'm not sure if that's what he's uh, referring to. Um, at any rate, let's see. Uh, Zachary F said a very enjoyable presentation, especially nice to mix uh, foreign and U S examples. Um, my question is how do you organize and store your collection? Uh, right now, not well. <laughs> As I say, I was an accumulator, so I, I took pains to make sure that uh, the coins were protected from uh, corrosion and moisture and, and light. But on the organizational side, I, I think I, uh, I've really fallen short. And then that's what I plan to spend some time on. And, and it's, a, it's a way, literally, literally of rediscovering uh, some of the things that maybe I, I vaguely remembered or rediscovering things that I, I just completely forgot that I had. Uh, and so I think that this is this talk was an impetus uh, for leading me into thinking about how exactly do I organize this and, and how do I kind of maintain some of these interesting uh, stories or correlations between U.S. coins and foreign coins uh, and the sense of deja vu extending over decades or, or even centuries and that, that's part of the fun yeah i uh, just typed something uh to uh, uh to answer that question uh susan maltby of uh coin world uh i'm not sure if she still writes articles but used to a lot of great information about uh coin storage and preservation so just maybe do a an online search of susan maltby m-a-l-t-b-y I agree. I've been reading her column for, for years and years and years, and she has some really good practical information. Yeah, certainly. Uh, there's also a book, uh, if you really want to explore that, uh, Coin Chemistry by Weimar White. Another uh, one out there in a couple different editions. Uh, another question, uh, William N. asks, uh, he said, Brilliant presentation. Maybe he meant to put an exclamation point of a question mark. Um, as an honest collector, what do you think of cleaning coins? I know the official A and A stance is no, don't do it. <laughs> well, I, I admit that this is really has me torn, and I've been fortunate in most of the coins I've had. I've kept in the, in the condition that I've obtained them. And, and I also follow the idea that you, you try to buy the best specimen that you can, can reasonably afford and preserve it. Uh, but I have the occasional coin that, that really is kind of sorry because of tarnish or some corrosion, and I'm really torn. And so far, I've held off on any kind of changes uh, because I think, think you know, I, I really don't think that's fair, but, uh, you know, Perhaps in a few very low value coins that really are ugly, I, I might consider experimenting at some point. But I'd say with the bulk of my collection, the, the valuable ones or the historical ones, uh, no cleaning. Yeah, yeah um, of course, conservation is a different story. So if you ever needed to uh, consult uh, NGC or technically NCS, uh, Numismatic Conservation Services, which is a branch of uh, the collector's group, uh, you may want to um, speak to them about uh, doing some kind of a uh, cleaning or, you know, careful conservation. Clean's a dirty word in this hobby. So uh, that was uh, about it for the questions I saw. There was one other thing here uh, through the chat. Yeah, just a thank you. Yeah, it was a, it was a really good presentation, Dr. Liu. Thank you. So, so folks, again, uh, we hope you will join us for our future webinars. Um, you can always check the ANA website, money.org, uh, for more information under the heading uh, where it says events and webinars. Uh, tomorrow at this uh, same time, 10 a.m. Uh, Mountain, uh, Ralph Wetterin will be uh, doing a talk on uh, proof walking liberty half dollar. So uh, please tune in then if you can. So folks, thank you very much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Stay safe out there and please continue to enjoy our hobby. Thanks again. Hope you enjoyed.